guys. So this is Moab. This is one of three parts that was given. I am only allowed to share publicly the parts that I'm giving out. I would advise you personally to be extremely careful about speaking about this, researching about this. Prayer is your best friend on this one, okay? Uh, so I was given this at 1010 in the Greek. That's an advisor specifically from the Jewish Sanhedrin, a counselor or a senator. And then in the Hebrew, it is the house of Baal, the habitation of Baal, the place east of the Jordan, arguably one and the same. Listen to the words. Here we go. The zoo explodes. Wild men will explode. They will be like wild beasts. These days approach. Pray. Moabites approach. They are brutal. They seek to put an end to Western lifestyle. Look in the Bible and see the patterns of what the Moabites have with those who now have. It is a sick game the <laughs> have crafted. Elements from every culture who warred against them <laughs> over time to be applied to America. They are bitter and angry at the success of Christians. They are the ones who crafted the downfall of the United States. Knowing the wars of Israel will help. Each culture had things they were known for. Then at 1030, Greek is the gnashing of teeth. The Hebrew is Beth Shemite, a tribe of Judah. And the tone of voice that God had shifted gears significantly. He was quite angry when he delivered this part. <laughs> See Americans as Christians. They do not understand that Christians are individuals. They only think in nations. They want to punish Christians, so they punish America. They have agreed with other countries deceitfully to help with America's downfall. Each king wishes to deceitfully take the throne, so they help. What is coming from their design will be primal and barbaric. Nothing your generations have seen. They believe they will draw Christians out to fight and plan to later round them up and exterminate them like Germany did to them. They are fools. My true people will not react. They will not join. They will be silent. They curse themselves as they side with Satan. They know the true God would not approve of what they plan, but they care more about power more than truth, just like they did with my son. The illogical injustice will follow the patterns of how they treated Jesus. They will be to mine how they were to him. But after they see that I deliver my true people from all the horrors they plan, they will know before their defeat that I am the true God and that they tromped on my true people and I delivered them, the Christians. They will see. The games they plan are evil and of deception. This is an ode to their true God, Satan. They cannot hear my words or my voice because they do not have the Holy Spirit and they are not mine. Their biggest deception is getting Christians to side with them while their very intent is to slaughter them with the hands of others. Bricks and stones do not build a house. I build the house and I do it with my people. They cannot build a kingdom because I am not in it. These things have been foreseen. Faith is about to build. Many with weak faith are going to cry out and see wonders. They have not planned for this because they cannot fathom it occurring. They are so egotistical. They think they are the only ones who should receive miracles. Because they no longer receive them, they make false miracles and try to prove to the world that they are blessed. The leaders are evil. I will save a remnant of them but not the leaders. They are too far from righteousness and too deep into evil. 
They repeat the sins of their fathers, which is idol worship, pride, and not knowing God. This is as predicted. Then there was a shift in time and tone here, like a time gap happened and then the angry tone dissipated. And this is a different topic as well. Monsters will arrive. Well-crafted deceptions. They have been planning for years. They have been conditioning people for years with movies in hopes to control by fear. My true people will not be convinced of or in fear. Stand firm. No one can harm you. They are a deception. You have my full power. Do not be fearful or dismayed. Have full confidence. Kindness to others will open doors to share me. Much will change. Hold on tight. The day of the Lord approaches. There is no stopping this. This means strange and unthinkable things will occur by the enemy in an attempt to control. The kindness of the Lord will be upon his people. This number of who are his will grow quickly. People will have a choice to be in deep fear and be ruled or to be in great peace and be free. Many will choose freedom because of my prayer choir. You keep your course. Nothing will sway you. Your leadership best done in prayer and one-on-one. -on -one. I will test the hearts as the days unfold. The true ones will trust me and recall my provisions. The weak and the wavering will submit to panic and fear. The days approach. And this ended at 10.53 p.m. In the Greek, that is the land of Galatia or Turkey. These included later the Celts and the Vikings. Um... Also, the reason for the book of Galatians is that the Christians there were under hard times since the Jews were the influential Judaizers demanded they live under Mosaic law as a requirement of the Christian faith. Then in 45 AD, the apostles came together and dealt with this issue in Acts 15, preaching freedom in Christ from the law. This will repeat the... But... That law is a deception to kill Christians. In Hebrew, this word is a house of the sun or sun temple, idol worship, a city in southwest Judah, Naphtali, Issachar, and Egypt, Baal, Ra, Helios, um, Adam, Horus, Shemesh, Medusa, Cherazin, Zeus, the Catholic images of solar-based and solar calendars in the Gregorian calendar and the solar energy push. This is all directed at the pagan god. Okay, now, notable. The Moabites were from Lot's daughters when they decided to get daddy drunk and have some kids, which is pretty gross. And they were always enemies of the Israelites. Also notable, Nebo, which is the false god and another name for Nimrod or Baal, was said to be the most cruel human on the earth who began the Tower of Babel and began human sacrifice for Baal worship. Recalling this, the spirit of Nebo will be placed within the Antichrist before he rises to power. As another point of interest, Mount Nebo is within Moabite territory. So the Moabites being referenced can be literally genetically Moabite, or we can be talking about all those who are into paganism and Baal worship. I did get the sense that they were definitely from the Middle East. Okay, so here's the verses. Zephaniah 2.8. I have heard of the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Jeremiah 48, 1, against Moab. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, woe to Nebo, for it, for it is plundered. Kirjathim is shamed and taken. The high stronghold is shamed and dismayed. Numbers 21, 29, woe to you, Moab. You have perished, O people of Shamash. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to Sion, king of the Amorites. 
So after this, I recall the dream or vision I had a few days before, which was very intense. And I saw that they will literally invade and slaughter. I recall there were men with curved swords slaughtering people. I did not see the gory stuff. I just saw the motion of them attempting to do this and I knew it was occurring. The men were going house by house in America in the thick of night. In their sleep, people were overcome, unaware. They would sneak in and just slaughter families. Um, I had the sense that this came over the Texas border at Mexico, but it also spread out to various cities. I was like, well, that is so gross. I'll put that on the back burner. Hopefully that's like not in the path. But then all these details started adding up. And then I was shown that they may aim at slaughtering men, rounding up women, committing them to slavery to their God. This would indeed cause a stir, if, especially for men, as seen in previous prophecies, how difficult it will be for people to not stand up and defend, right? In a different part of the prophecy that cannot be shared, it stated that a ritual curse had been done to allow this and that praying Christians will be protected from this. We will wake in the morning and hear of the horrors and pray for all involved. Now the women become slaves to their God. Is this religion pagan? They claim to worship the same God of Abraham. Is there a pagan God to make captives worship this? Let's explore it. There's, this is a brief review of biblical understanding of paganism. So around 4000 BC was creation. Adam and Eve worshipped God and lived in the Garden of Eden. So here's an image of a well-researched Garden of Eden area. The entire zone is the land of Eden. The Garden of Eden is near the water. There's lots of verses. Someone has done this work, not myself, but his website's on there if you want to zoom in. Then, the fall of Adam and Eve, tainted by sin, cast out of the garden, arguably in the Fertile Crescent, because that's probably where they were. Here's the Fertile Crescent. If you zoom in from that area, just the areas of the Tigris and Euphrates is the Fertile Crescent. Then Cain's sacrifice is rejected because his heart was not right before God. So roughly 4200 BC, Cain murders Abel. Cain is cast away and settles in the land of Nod, which is east, and built a city. His descendants were evil and wicked, says the Bible. So where's Nod? Here's Nod. If you say that here's the Fertile Crescent, and then here's Sumer and Ur and Uruk and all those fancy places, Across the water to the east was the land of Nod. Then around 4000 BC, the ancient city of Sumer was established in Mesopotamia. Great archaeological evidences are in Sumer and Mesopotamia of pagan idol worship and of this time period being accurate. Around 2348 BC, God is not happy with all the wickedness on the earth, and he tells Noah to build an ark, which he does. And then the great flood occurs to push the reset button on humanity. Then, not too long after that, in 2200 BC, the age of mega idol worship was at its height again. Ancient Egypt and the pyramids were built. The Tower of Babel was built. God shuffled up all the men at the Tower of Babel, and all these men took their idol worship to their own lands. Some gods are the same god, but they have different names because of the language being confused. There are new traditions also that sprouted. Sometimes they would cross over and a god would be confused and they would take a different meaning. So that's why the whole thing is so confusing to try and unfurl. Okay, so let's look at the three main pagan gods that are in this region where humanity was established. They all have a father, a son, and a mother, and the son was the was the pagan savior character, okay? Now, we've got these different cities, Sumer, Mesopotamia, Babylon, Uz, because Abraham came from Uz, and then the Bible names for these different characters. All right, so the father, this is an idol of Baal. In Sumer, they called him Surtur, Mesopotamia, Enki, in Babylon, Baal, in Uz, Ea. And then the Bible names are Baal, Nimrod, Serpent, Dragon, God of this age, and Father of Lies. Sounds an awful lot like Team S's captain, right? Then we've got the sun. So in Sumer, it's Demuzi. In Mesopotamia, 
Damuzid, pretty close. In Babylon, Tammuz, pretty close. Just change the front letter, right? And then Uz is Marduk, and the Bible name is Tammuz, which is, by the way, a month in the Hebrew calendar. Then we've got the mother, which in Sumer was Inanna. In Mesopotamia was Dutter. In Babylon was Ishtar. In Uz was Enlil. In the Bible, she's called Ashtoreth or Ashtarte, and also the Queen of Heaven. Wickedness. We need to understand what wickedness is. The first mention is Genesis 6. It was explained as this. Every intent of the thoughts of the heart was evil continually. So continual evil. Notice the parallel to Cain. Those who followed the way of Cain are to be warned of receiving his consequences. The way of Cain is anger, murder, revenge, boasting of sins, polygamy, belonging to the evil one, doing evil deeds, lacking faith, perverting the grace of God as a license for immorality. Wickedness, if we fast forward to King Ahab's wickedness, 2 Kings 21, he sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, which is described as he behaved very abominably. How? In following idols. Then if we skip to Jeremiah 116, again, it explains wickedness, deserving of judgment because they have forsaken God, because they burned incense to other gods, and because they worship the works of their own hands. Wickedness includes more than idol worship, but idol worship is wicked. Just to clarify that. So the Hebrew is Ra, the same name as the Egyptian God, a thing or way of thinking or behaving that is morally wrong and displeases Jehovah, the one true God. Then Aven means vain things, especially used of all things pertaining to idols and their worship, also refers to fraud, falsehoods, and iniquity, which is a type of sin. Then we've got the Greek, which is por poneria, which is depravity, iniquity, wickedness, malice, having all evil purposes and desires. And there's kakia, which is malignant, malignity, ill will, a desire to injure, depravity, evil, wickedness, that is not ashamed to break laws. Okay, moving on the timeline. We've got around 2100 BC, Abraham is called out of Ur in the Fertile Crescent by God to be a new set-apart nation. So here's where he's from. Now let's learn a tiny bit about that area. Ur was the hub or center of Mesopotamia. Ur was known for its pagan idol worship. Ur was the New York City or the LA or the London of its time. Ur was famous for ziggurats for idol worship. So those were called high places. All right. Around 1446 BC with Moses, God set up the laws for God's nation. So what happens in the laws that relate to this? God's law and instructions. So in the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, it just starts out right off the bat. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I am the Lord your God. So that is very strong language. Do not be in idol worship. Moving forward to Deuteronomy 6, 4 and then jumping to 14. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. So every country around Israel is worshiping false gods. That's the implication. Then Deuteronomy 8.1. Every command which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. This states that it's not optional. And because it says carefully observe, that tells us it could be easy to slip up. So we have to understand that this was probably not that easy for them being surrounded in their culture, similar to us. 
We're, we're skipping forward a lot. We jump to 30 AD, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, establishing all who follow Christ, which means Christianity, as the religion that follows God. Those that reject him, Jesus, reject God. So let's look at the words of Christ, what he said in his own words. All right, we've got John 8.31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. John eight forty two to 44a, and then skipping to 47. If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He who is of God hears God's words, therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. John fourteen four six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John thirteen thirty six. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John twelve forty eight. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I will have spoken will judge him in the last day. And then John ten thirty. And I and the Father are one. Then around 49 AD, Paul takes the gospel to Arabia. Now I'll show you later that these people already had heard about Jesus, but that is definitely mission work went that, to that direction. Here are Paul's words that show that he went to this area. Galatians, Galatians 1, 5 through 17. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not rush to consult with the flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to the apostles who came before me, but I went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Circa 610 AD, Muhammad, a citizen of Mecca in a pre-Islamic Arabia, a place of idol worship who had heard and rejected Jesus, who had heard of and rejected Jesus, i.e. rejected the God, received revelations to start Islam. Around 622 AD, Islamic Crusades begin, and basically it's a convert or die situation. And then around 1630 AD, and there's a lot more story with this black stone thing, but... Uh, they did have this black stone in their presence much earlier than this, but around 1630 AD, the black stone was placed in the Hajj for all to come and see and kiss during their pilgrimage. Okay, so here's the black stone. It's in the corner of that black cube building, and the, the person goes to this black stone and kisses it, and then they're supposed to encircle the Hajj seven times counterclockwise. Let's look at some observations about this black stone. The rock is set into the eastern corner of the Hajj. One tradition says it was given to Adam from an angel and was white until Adam sinned, then it turned black. Another tradition says it was a fragment of a meteorite. The stone was worshipped in the Nabataean culture long before Muhammad. Okay, the Nabataeans, you have to know who they are. In the Old Testament, they were in the territory from the Fertile Crescent, which we already know where that is, up by the Euphrates, to the lands of the Moabites and the Edomites, so south of Judah and all the way into Saudi Arabia. They were north, south, east, and southeast, and west of Israel. Um, Modern-day Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Palestine had Nabataeans in it. Genesis 25.13 points out that their origin, Ishmael's firstborn, was called Nabahoth. The language changed over time and they became Nabataeans, but Nabahoth was the person who established this culture. They were a polytheistic culture with over 600 gods, but their main god was Dushara, equivalent to Baal or Zeus. They worshipped him at high places, which could be a ziggurat or could be a stack of stones on a high mountain or hill. And they placed a black stone or a black obelisk at their place of worship. This is verifiable through archaeology and there are remains of the animal sacrifices that have been found at these high places. Now in the New Testament, the classic period of these people was in the first century. 
right around when Christ and the church was being started, right? They were responsible for the ruins at Petra. Petra houses an ancient temple that sits over what they felt was the gates of hell. They were in a region called Idumea, which was east of the Jordan, also called Edom. Herod the Great, known for being very harsh, was in charge when Jesus was born. He was from Idumea. Mark 3, 8, people came from Idumea to hear Jesus. So this is the first time when people start hearing about Jesus. Then Paul goes later. Is this particular religion pagan? That's the question. The Old Testament calls out the Gentile nations surrounding the Israelites by naming the gods and goddesses that they worship. So let's explore this for a second. We've got the five pillars of Islam, which are well known in our times. So um, I might be saying these wrong, but the Shahada testified that Allah is the one and only creator God. That's their, that's their belief. And Salat is five times a day prayer towards Kaaba. Kaaba is that black stone. Uh, Swam is the annual fast of Ramadan. The Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca to worship the black stone and march around the Kaaba seven times. And then the Zakat giving is giving alms to the poor. So here's a little bonus ruling they have now, which is Jihad, a holy war converting or killing. And if you die doing it, you go directly to paradise. Now, the five practices in Babylon. This is the surrounding nations to Israel, right? Because Babylon is just the grandfather of all these other little subcultures that came about, okay? So they had a word called Shahara. It meant dedicated to their national god of Marduk called Shahada in Akkadian. So the Akkadian word for Marduk is Shahada. Do we think that that is totally insane? That in the five pillars... The Shahada is Allah? I think that's insane. Okay, number two. The prayers for the prayers were at that time four times a day. So sunrise, mid morning, afternoon, and sunset. Prayers and rituals were performed to honor various deities. All right, number three. The annual feast for the festival of Isis. She's the Venus or the moon goddess, depending on which subculture you're in. Number four, Isis, the moon goddess, was represented by a black stone set in the center of a circle. The people had to march around it seven times, once for each known planet. And then Zakat was a Sumerian tradition, Sumer, as in where the origins were for humanity, Sumer. It was a Sumerian tradition of setting people free, canceling the king's taxes. All right, so now we're going to go to look at this. This is um, the 99 names for Allah. There are some interesting parallels with the Babylonian situation, okay? The entire Babylonian pantheon added up to 99 gods. I don't think that's a coincidence. Each main god or goddess had many names. So Nana had 30 names, Nebo had 12, Ishtar had 15, Shamash had 20, Nurgle had 18, Marduk had 10, Baal had 50, Adar had 14. Okay, so still on this 99 names for Allah. The Quraysh tribe, which is Muhammad's tribe he grew up in, worshipped 360 gods, one per day of the year, I guess. Muhammad turned those idols into the daughters of Allah. Hubble was the highest ranking of all of the 360 gods. He turned this into the Kaaba, the god of the Quran. Hubble had three forms, light, rain, and earth, similar to the eastern five elements. And these were the three daughters of Baal to the supreme Canaanite god. All right, the moon god or goddess archaeology proves scripture. Listen to this. In the 1920s, Sir Leonard Woolley excavated Ur and found extensive evidence of the original pagan worship sites pointing out that the moon god was their chief god. The oldest name found for the moon god was in Sumer or Ur and it was the name of Sin. The region of Sinai was named after their god. In 
the 1950s, the moon god was excavated at Hazer in Palestine. Two idols of the moon god were found. A man was seated on a throne with a crescent moon carved into his chest. The temples had fire-based thrones to do human sacrifices. Seven babies were sacrificed or humans were tortured and their hearts removed while still alive, etc. And then they were burnt. This was a high honor, like jihad death is now. Arabs worshipped the 360 gods, but the moon god was their chief god. This was proven in the 1950s excavations of Arabia. Different Nabataean regions used various dialects, and near Mecca, the name of the moon god was La, which eventually morphed into Allah, pre muhammads visions. Muhammad kept the Allah name and moon god symbolism and traditions, but the big change was he was claiming the revelation had said, now we are monotheistic. We just worship the one moon god, the black rock and the crescent moon included. The moon god had other names in other regions, Baal, Moloch, Baphomet, Jupiter, Zeus, Nana, Sin, Diana, Artemis, Luna, Konzu, Osiris, Hercules, Dionysus, Quisitacoro, Yi, and Krishna. Some cultures replaced the moon goddess to be the highest goddess, Isis, Ishtar, Enlil, Dutter, Hathor, Astarte, Ashtoreth, Ephrodite, Diana, Sibyl, Venus, Madonna, Heavenly Mother, Frigg, Hengo, Kotlaku, and Devaki. So, could Allah be Jehovah, the god of the Israelites, the god of the Christians? Impossible. There is no way this is the way of Cain. So now I need to share with you a bunch of different things. Some are dreams and some are um, little words that make all of this kind of pull together. Dream one is the bomb. This was actually not my dream. This is given to my fourth child on 31722. And it's very quick and simple. She was in a very populated open area like you might see in a city square or in front of a sports stadium. And a Middle Eastern guy was setting off 24 bombs and she knew the bombs were about to go off. She crunched down. He died in the bombing. Everyone around the area died in the bombing. But after the bombs went off, she stood and she noticed that she was a lot taller than her normal um, four foot 11 self. And that she had this super amazing, beautiful, silver, super shiny sword. And it had a cool, unique shape, shape on it, like nothing she's seen on this earth. She said it was probably three feet long and she also was in a glorified body and had wings. So she woke up and thought, oh, we're going to get bombed soon. So given those clues, I think that the anointed leave before this particular bombing. Dream number two was given to me on 10, 11, 23. And I call it the mem. M-E-M -E stands for Middle Eastern Man. So there was a Mem sitting in a chair to my left facing me. He had some kind of 70s looking device about 18 inches wide by 6 inches high and probably 10 inches deep. And I thought, I wonder if this is for recording. I was in a concrete room, cold and clean. I was seated at a modern but classic folding table. At the right corner facing me was a man who looked like Liam Neeson. I think that... Given the modern understanding of Liam Neeson, he is associated mostly with like vengeance and survivor type stories where he goes after and like rescues his family member or whatever and he like blows everyone up and kills everyone and gets like rescues the person. But he was with me at this table. In this dream, which started and stopped all night long, giving more and more information to this dream, the mem was saying to try and intimidate me and it apparently wasn't working. So here's how it went. The mem is yelling, you know what this means? Then he got up in my face and he started aggressively and hatefully yelling at me. And in the dream, I knew he first said in his language, A, B, C, then something that I did not know. And then he shouted, Allah Akbar, which means God is greater. Obviously, this means his version of God, which is Ishtar, Venus, whatever. So I say, nope, 
irreverently, like whatever, I don't care. I had no fear at all in this situation. Then the mem said, you're stupid. And the inference was, you're stupid because you don't understand my holy language. You're an infidel, you're an idiot. And me, I felt like he really wanted to harm me, but all he could do was get one inch from my face. And at this point I was smiling and I thought it was kind of funny that he was obviously restricted from me, that he could not do what he wanted to do, which made the mem violently enraged with me. And Liam was slightly puzzled, but I was smiling and I was thinking of worship songs. I was in my mind singing the song from Ancient Gates, Brook Litterwood, sing until your voice gives out, no matter where or who's around, release your worship. Then I began to think of the song, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Then I began to hum the second song, I love you, Lord. And then I broke out into song in this intense situation, just singing boldly. The mem was very confused why I was not reacting to his anger and getting up in my face. And then me, I just knew he couldn't do anything to me. And that just made me smirk. The mem left the room very angry. I know that he was going to bring back another mem to interrogate me. But after he left, knowing we were on camera, we were very careful. But Liam looked at me and said, why are you so calm? And I said, don't you have faith? God will protect us. And Liam looked a little worried. And as I heard the next man coming in, I looked at Liam and the mem brought in a very large, very intimidating looking, angry, hateful mem with him. And then both went over to the device on the table and the angry mem was trying to fix something with it. I disappeared right in front of their faces and they were baffled freaked out they were like where did she go <laughs> so obviously this is after translation here's the interpretation liam neeson is like the world's version of someone that can rescue but he was not helpful nor was he confident the proper response to a terrorist being angry at you is joy and worship this gave protection and apparently baffled them, which was a nice bonus. This shows the protection of God's people, no matter how bad it may look. The first mem was restrained from doing anything to me besides shouting at me. I am already in my transformed body in this dream. So I was just chilling with this dude and then I disappeared. It was not a rapture. It was a special skill. I feel that this was given, feel that I was in that situation, maybe to collect data or something. And then I disappeared because I needed to show them that God is powerful and this is not a normal situation for them. Okay. So, uh, the first thing is I had a vision of muscle men flexing and then I heard, um, God say, the kings flex for power. They were wearing green tank tops. So this represents green of Mother Earth and war. Sabotage in the U.S. The U.S. will sabotage its own people. Mine will be spared. 127.23. The world is about to erupt. One day you will awaken and the world will be chaos. It will have started elsewhere and spread. 2 21, 24 I had a short dream and I saw a match strike on a box and it became a flame. Then I heard words upon awakening. The events will begin. One match starts it all. 2023. Um, my number four daughter had a dream and it was a sea of fire. The sea of fire turned into an angry crowd and about one eighth of them got sucked up into a cloud. Then she said she knew that one eighth were anointed. Then the crowd panicked for a minute. Another group of people got sucked up into the cloud. She felt that this was the rapture. Then the fire crowd was covered in oppressive darkness. We know that this is that time after rapture when it's completely dark and demonic. On the very next night, after she got these words, even though she didn't tell me these words until days after, the following night, I had this exact dream on repeat that the people 
were on fire and upset and people were leaving. And then the people were on fire and upset and more people left. And then it was complete darkness. Um, I have this information about a war and uprising that I need to add to this. Um, there was a black man with a bald head. I think he was African American, but I can't verify that. Somewhere in the South or the Southeast. He looked very similar to Nick Fury from Marvel. He was said to be a strong Christian and I believe he was a pastor. He wore a black leather coat and he had a semi-automatic military looking black rifle. He was getting everyone excited for war and telling them it was the Christian thing to do to help God, saying God supported this. This was based on Old Testament wars and they were rounding up and killing those who called themselves Christians but did not believe the same as them. So if you are willing to defend with a gun, then they would just round you up and kill you too. In the dream, he was walking past me and he smiled a very dark demon-like smile. And I knew he was a fake Christian, a deception. I knew he was supporting the new world order and he was of those that have that new Christianity where they have a goal to attain to follow the false Messiah. And those that stuck with the Bible, these were the true Christians. They were calling apostates or something like that. They were trying to collect and kill who they said were apostates. They were doing, quote, God's work, they thought. Then after that, when I woke up, I heard these words. There are New World Order Christians. They will turn on those that believe in the biblical doctrine of Christianity. Then on 3, 26 and 27, my word holds true. People will lash out soon. The pot to boil over with sin. Look away. Isolate. There's a few more. Uh, this is about jihad which is specifically what I was told with the Moab thing is going to happen in the words that I can't give out. Um, so this was given on 3524. I saw an image of a jihadist. His head was covered and he had a mask on. Only his eyes were showing. And then he began to run. And then I heard jihadist war soon. All right, then this is a little project that I was pressed to do and led through. I found some very interesting things that I don't know because, you know, I don't really think much about other lands, to be honest, as an American. So this is jihad, the four initial jihads. So number one, the jihad of the heart. This is to fight evil within oneself. Number two, the jihad of the mind, to condone right behavior. Number three, jihad of the tongue, to counsel those who have gone astray. Number four, jihad of the sword. This has been re redefined over the centuries, but used of aggression for perceived holy purposes is the basic concept of the jihad of the sword. So when people talk about jihad in public, they're talking about the jihad of the sword. And then the people who are defending themselves often like, oh no, we don't believe that. We're not whatever. They're talking about jihad of the heart or the mind or the tongue. So they're not lying technically because that is a jihad that they practice. Um, it's just a way that they can communicate with um, some more trickery, I guess. Okay. So being the jihad of the sword, then I found that there are seven swords of jihad. And this is over their time periods, how things have changed. And so I'm supposed to share this with you. The, the first uh, sword of jihad, it was the established order. It was established by Muhammad. This was used to expand Islam with force if necessary. So this is kind of like the crusades, okay? Because they had their own crusades like the Catholics did. Number two. War versus apostates and rebels. These are their own believers that are not as disciplined as they should be. This was established by Abu Baker and it was called Rida. Uh, war against their own subjects that are apostate. The third sort of jihad, 
revolt versus non-Sharia leaders. So leaders that are not holding to the law specifically. This was established by Ibn Taymiyyah, possibly. That's a lot of whys in a word, I don't know. This was established in the second half of the 13th century. It was previously prohibited to revolt versus your own leader, but this changed at this point um, versus the Mongols. It changed if the leaders do not live as a true Muslim and if their rules do not conform to Sharia law, then the people are permitted to jihad revolt versus their leaders. If their leader would per permit any other religion beside Islam, then it was okay to jihad on that leader. One who believes part of the book of the Quran, but disbelieves another part, it was okay to jihad with the sword upon these people. Not keeping Sharia or permitting other religions and not believing the entire Quran are all signs that one is kafir or an unbeliever and they should die by the sword. These all apply to their own leaders being un-Islamic. Ibn Tamiyah established a doctrine of excommunication. Okay, the next jihad was the house cleaning. It was established by And al-Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabi Islam, and it was used for military and Shiha Wilahua for spiritual revival and purification within British controlled areas. In the 17th century, Europeans pushed into the Islamic territories and they threatened Islamic areas such as North Africa, India, and the Middle East. There was a need for jihad war based on the resistance and Western influences to keep the purity of Islamic faith. The fifth sword was the law versus polytheism. This was established by Abu al Madudi, the Indian Pakistani regions, and the Sayyid Qutb in the Egypt. This was established post World War II. The Arabian leaders in the Middle East and the Western soft powers were seen to be creating a new polytheism and ignorance. The reaction was Sharia law needed to be reimposed very strictly. The doctrine of excommunication, apostate leaders were to be um, rested in purification, established with the sword. The sixth jihad was survival and sovereignty, established by Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian in 1979. The jihad was crucial to stop the Soviet domination in Afghanistan without theological motivation just to defend the land. He traveled the world preaching jihad to defend any Muslim land. It becomes a personal obligation of every Muslim man, woman, or child to march forward without permission of their loved ones, not marching for bears, and punishments from Allah of torments of being replaced with another people. By the late 1980s, this type of jihad became synonymous with guerrilla resistance to communist invasion or dictatorship. Azam died in 1989. The seventh sword is the guerrilla terrorism. It was established by Osama bin Laden, a disciple of Azam, rejected by his own government when he offered to protect Saudi Arabia from Iraq with his own Arabian fighters. He changed the mission. He established Al-Qaeda and he defined jihad as willful attacks on civilians by non-state actors through unconventional means. It is what the West calls terrorism. Under his lead, the terrorism began with East Africa, the embassy bombing, and then the September 11th attacks in New York City and Washington DC and the USS Cole fighting the far enemy. The far enemy is seen as intruders. The Cold War had begun, so they viewed that they had defeated the godless Soviets, but he was still angry that the US was invited by his own government to help. So his group began doing jihad versus the apostate House of Sand 
and U.S. targets and all of its allies. Okay, now we need to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. This relates back to that um, first video where we had all that um, timeline stuff. So there's a transitional Sunni Islamic organization that was established by Hassan al-Banna in 1928 in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood began to rid Egypt of British colonial control by teaching the illiterate, setting up hostels and businesses. They had political efforts to end British control. They had a self-stated aim to reestablish a caliphate and to be a state ruled by Sharia law. Caliphate is a religious leader for a country. Their doctrine inspires most jihad movements. The slogan is, Islam is the solution when they do charity work. It was a fringe group until the Six-Day War of Israel, when Islam replaced secular Arab nationalism when defeated by Israel. In 2012, in Egypt, the first elected to power with the Brotherhood title, then the president of Egypt lost his rule and being overthrown to the Persian Gulf monarchies of Saudi Arabia and the UAE declared them a terrorist group so that they would not lose their kingdoms. Harakat <coughs> al Islamia or Hamas, founded in 1987, is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood tree. Hamas gives extensive social services to the Palestinians and became, became very popular. Hamas releases the first official statement December 14, 1987. That is of its connection to the Muslim Brotherhood. Its focus was on Palestine, nationalism, Sharia law, corresponding to the failed PLO of the time. Rejection of all negotiations with Israel. Only through violent jihad would they reach their goals. Complete destruction of Israel is their goal. Con creating an Islamic state in its place of all historic Palestine and defining Jews as Israel. They see political, social, charitable, and military as self-reinforcing to achieve all of their goals. September 23rd, 2022 Friday in Libra, you know, the uh, pagan thing. I don't agree with that, but whatever. In Libra, which is called the scales, the balance, Palestine gives Israel a one year deadline to make a two state solution, or they promise to attack them and gain back their land. The same day, Israel announces they have a proper heifer, okay for sacrifice to remove sins of the people three days before Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement. September 23rd, 2023, a year later, Saturday, fall equinox, these guys are so lame, and also the day of the seven-year UN Global Agreement to accelerate for reaching the goals of 2030. October 7th, 2023, a Saturday, their Sabbath, Hamas launched a surprise attack that led to the deadliest day in Israel's history since its independence. October 13th, 2023, Friday, Hamas called for global jihad and worldwide protests to deliver the message of anger in support of Palestinians versus Israel. On Friday the 13th, really? Like these guys are so predictable at this point. So what is the trajectory? Two dreamers saw a well-known Imam at a university in the USA with media coverage called for Jihad on America. Then there's the Moab events. The different dreamers saw an Islamic flag hanging from the White House and simultaneous attacks on the US soil by Islamists. So to understand who is in this brotherhood, they have symbols and signals. There's four fingers being up this is called Rabbah, and it is solidarity to the Muslim Brotherhood. Here you can see Erdogan has his four fingers up in his speech. Um, to me, this is a ritual because it looks much like a Nazi salute. Slightly different angle, very similar. 11 of the 21 main Egyptian gods only have four fingers shown. Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormonism, they all have hand sim symbols to promote energy flow or for their rituals. Freemasons and Mormons have secret hand symbols. Youth culture has four fingers up. This is a secret way to say you are of the rainbow persuasion. 
So these hand symbols are very significantly tied into paganism because Satan only has so many tools in his toolbox and that's all he's got to work with. So he's got to keep repeating the same kinds of things in all different branches because he he's limited to what he can do. Okay, another one is 22124. These are words they were given around 9.15 a.m. God's power versus magic's power. This is very inspiring and very encouraging. What is the difference between God's power and magic? Besides the obvious that God's power is good and magic does evil, the source of power is so different. God's power is from the original of life and light. But magic's power is from death and darkness, so it can never supersede God's power. Their power is from a created one who sinned, not the origin of the power itself. To bind Satan limits his power and his team's access to it even further. To pray that they are taken away to the pit requires a process in which they are entrapped and removed or destroyed and removed disallowing any of their power to be used again. This reduces the total amount of power available from their side. This means their team must generate more power somehow. They can gain more power by feeding on human fear, blood that is required, blood that is acquired in evil ways, pain, and other things that trigger negative feelings. This is why those full of faith do not fear because they know I am their protector and I supersede the enemy's power and their lack of fear. This blocks the ability of the enemy to feed off of them or draw power from their fear. The more people with full faith, the less the enemy can draw power from humans. So they must rely on the power that Satan can generate. He being a created one lacks the ability to generate much power. Their entire end game is built on fear to fuel their magic. If you do not fear, their magic is not effective on you. Pray for others to be fearless. Pray for others to have my discernment. It strips power from the evil ones. Nothing can strip power from a holy one. Worship fuels it. Faith fuels it. The blood of Christ gives it the power to work in humans. I choose who are the responsible recipients of it and how much of it each will wield. So this was ending at 10.52 a.m. Mark 10.52 says, Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Okay. So that's a lot of information, I know. And um, just pray over it, and um, God will keep you. All right? See you next time.